and welcome back to the United Masterclass, a tactical podcast about Manchester United. I'm your host, Hader Abani, and I'm joined as ever by Rob Blanchett. Rob, this is a final one before the World Cup, and it is going to be an absolute mega show because United have claimed a fantastic last cast victory against Fulham with a sensational goal by new star boy Alejandro Garnacho. Great goal in the dying embers of the game. However, I don't even need to tell any of the listeners this. There's obviously been quite a distasteful interview with Cristiano Ronaldo, with the lovely Pierce Morgan, and that's really overshadowed what should be a fantastic show. We should be talking about a breakthrough moment for Garnacho and a really, really good victory going into the World Cup, some great progress from Manchester United. But unfortunately, we're talking about the ultimate betrayal. I know Ronaldo likes to use that word. We're talking about, you know, a player that should be leading by example, a player that should be, uh, you know, nurturing the youth and being a professional. He's gone and done the ultimate betrayal to his teammates, to the club that made him. And we're going to talk all about all of that today. So, Rob, welcome back. Almost uh, Jekyll and Hyde in terms of the topics. On the one end, we're talking about the breakthrough star. And on the other end, we're talking about the GOAT, who's a fading star. Yes, the best and the worst of Manchester United. I think one of the things that kind of get all of us who are football fans of a certain ilk or kind of how we want to watch football or support the football club is that United is a little bit of a reality TV drama crisis show, isn't it? It's a little bit like I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. Yes, we're going to have to address later on in the show what Cristiano has said and why he has said it and our thoughts on that. And you know, I think we've been pretty clear about Cristiano on the football pitch and we're going to try and marry those two things together. But we do want to kind of kick off with what's important. And what's important is the actual football. Manchester United went to Fulham, played a, probably a Fulham team in their best form in many, many years. A yo-yo club from the, from the championship who normally come up and get hammered every week in the Premier League. And that's not what this Fulham team is anymore. This is a good Fulham side. It's different. And Manchester United looked like in that last half an hour, they'd blown it. Looked like there'd only be one winner. Felt like the home side were going to take it. And what happened? Young lad, Garnacho, teenager, left winger, one-two with uh, with Christian Eriksen, into the box, beats his man. Doesn't thrash the ball across, does he? Just passes it into the side of a net like you'd expect a world-class player to do. So this is the start of Garnacho's career. And of course, it was a sad moment later on in the evening when that was stolen by CR7, by Cristiano. Um, horribly timed. Garnacho's first great moment in a Man United shirt in the Premier League. And he should be celebrating that today. Instead, He's probably having to lay low like the rest of the United team because I'm sure they've been told to keep their gob shut on social media and, and all the like. And uh, and instead, we are talking about a fading star. And I tweeted out just at the start, you know, a star is born as another star dies in its embers. And I think that's where we lie today as Manchester United fans. Going into a World Cup that we've all got weird feelings about. We'd rather it wasn't out in Qatar for, for whatever reasons that we know what they are as well. But here we are at the end of this cycle for Eric Ten Hag's first part of the season. And who are we talking about? We're talking about the striker that shouldn't be in Man United's team. Absolutely. And Rob, before we go into that, I just want to say happy birthday to Mawson. As you can see, that it's your birthday in the comments. So happy birthday. Have a fantastic day. And hopefully, you know, uh, we won't be talking about Ronaldo post the World Cup. Rob, we have to talk about him today. But before we do that, we will talk about the match breakdown because Man United scored a fantastic win. Against a very good Fulham side, really well drilled, as you mentioned, by Marco Silva. They've uh, played some fantastic football this year. And then we will talk about Garnacho's impact. We have to dig into that. His directness was fantastic. You know, he really has been brilliant. We will then go on to talk about Cristiano Ronaldo's comments. We know that the full interview isn't out by the time that the show does come out. But, uh, you know, we do have snippets, which um, I don't, don't really know how you can dress them up to look positive, Rob. I know people are trying to do that. So we will go into that. Then we will analyse, you know, sort of how he's performed this season with some stats. We'll do a bit of punditry on that as well. But as always, guys, make sure you give us a follow on at MC. Give me a follow on at Hader underscore Obani. And Rob will follow on at underscore Rob underscore B. Guys, as well, make sure you hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Give us a retweet when as many people involved in this conversation, whether you are Ronaldo in or let's say Ronaldo out. I hate that term. But uh, there is a little bit of a spit on that. So, Rob, let's start with the match breakdown and i just want to put this image up on the screen and if you're listening to this on spotify get down to youtube because we've got a picture 
of the man of the hour, Garnacho. <clears throat> Fantastic little cameo. What really impressed me is that he came onto the pitch, Rob, and he was direct. Something we've been asking, let's say, Sancho to do. Both big fans of Sancho, but hasn't been doing that. Direct, uh, tricky, effective. Uh, you know, he were, had end product, fearless, all those fantastic things. You know, I don't win that game if Garnacho doesn't come on and perform like the way he done. And I think what impressed me the most about him, though, is that he he doesn't look out of sorts, does he, on the big stage? He doesn't look like he's, uh, you know, he's unnerved. He doesn't look like he's, uh, you know, doesn't feel like he should be there. He's out of his skin, that sort of thing. You can see the image here as well. He does the Messi celebration, which is kind of ironic, isn't it? Now that everything's come out, we know that Ronaldo is his idol, but he's holding the shirt up, you know, with his name on the back. But I just thought it was a fantastic cameo. He's been impressive. He got a great assist midweek against Villa with a great ball into McTominay. And you know, he's got a real gem on his hands. And I think Ten Hag is really handling his development very, very well. That's the first thing. But I think the second thing is that he's not overplaying him. So he's playing him a little bit here. He could have started him again, couldn't he, in this game? But he's bringing him on. He's keep, keeping him hungry. He's keep, keeping him fresh. Uh, keeping, you know, sort of the... Keeping him on on his feet on the ground. I think that's important as well. So I've been really impressed with him. He's great to see. He's emerging at the right time. And I care about Garnacho, not Ronaldo right now. And that's the way it should be. And I think that any Man United fan that, that wants the best for the football team will feel exactly what you've just said there in those sentiments. Uh, I think it's interesting to say, first of all, with Garnacho at 18, that I think he's actually a more rounded product at that age than Cristiano was. So with Cristiano, we saw at 17 and 18, full of lollipops, full of falling over, full of kind of like, you know, tricks on the touchline, but not a lot of end product. And it took him a year or two to kind of get to where he needed to be. You know, he needed the time in the gym. He needed the time to train and get up to Fergie's standards. Garnacho, we have seen in the youth team for a while now. See, when, when he was headhunted from uh, Spain and brought to this country, it was felt that that he had the ability to, to knock on very quickly. And I had said, didn't I, in pre-season and last year, that I would like to see him expediate into the first team to get him these minutes. Now, I didn't think that he'd have this kind of impact, but I think it's it's quite clear to see this talent. Why Argentina jumped in so quickly to claim him as their own, because obviously he's from his Argentinian stock. But I do believe he was born in Spain, so he could have played for either country, but they wanted him as quick as possible. This is why you look at a player like him and you say, right, how quickly can you get him into that first team setup? So credit to Ten Hag, because you said it's about keeping him hungry. I think it's I think it's the other way. I think it's about protecting him. It's about actually saying to him, right, do you know what? I could pay you 20 games in a row, but it's not going to help your development. It's not going to help the team. So I'll get you in when you really needed, but I'll give you starts here and there, Europa League smaller matches. Uh, I wasn't surprised to see him on the bench against Fulham, but it was absolutely the right call to do when you're trying to switch your system with 25 minutes, half an hour to go to bring on a play like Ganacho. But the finish itself is still, it's still otherworldly. Like there's so much he has to do in terms of, of pass and move and get into that channel and beat his man without the ball, first of all, and then work out what do I do? Do I slide it or do I smash it or what? You know, we always criticise Marcus and Antti Martial, don't we, sometimes for just smashing it. Garnacho didn't think of that at all. Garnacho thought, I'm just going to slide it and pass it in that bottom corner and no one can do a damn thing about it. Incredible maturity at 18 years old. A huge career ahead of him. Manchester United need to sort his contract out. That needs to be done ASAP. Um, but a great moment for the boy. Really, really pleased for him. And just disappointed also in the sense that today was not primarily about Garnacho, that it was about Cristiano and the other parts. But of course, we'll address Cristiano later on in the show. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think uh, the biggest thing that I liked about Garnacho as well, Rob, is that um, every time he's come onto the pitch, whether he started or whether you know he's he's come on for a little cameo, he's always affecting the game. He's always showing yeah. for the ball. He's confident. The left-hand side looked really good. And when we talk about the game, we will talk about the game now, and we'll have a look at the, the team lineup here. As you can see, United did have a few players either out with suspension, so Dallow, and I mean, it really highlighted the need that, one, we need a right-back that needs to come in and challenge. Because I think Dallow has not been great the last two or three games. I like Dallow, and I think he's been you know, one of United's best players this year progressive he's improved but I think on the ball recently maybe it's tiredness as well I don't know maybe one eye on the World Cup I think he's been shaky he was he was particularly bad against Villa 
we saw Malassia play at right back. And they were saying in commentary, I think Gary Neville was saying, you know, you very rarely see a left footed right back, but you see a lot of right footed left backs. And I think that's actually a good point that I've never thought about. I'm not going to be too harsh on, uh, on Malassia. I know that he came away as, you know, one of the lowest um, performers along with Marcus Rashford here actually on the graphic. But I do think that with playing on the right hand side, not really used to it. I'm going to give him a bit of a pass because he's looked better on the left. But that was a real problem for United on that right-hand side of him and Alanga. So when Ganacho did come on, I was I was really impressed because, you know, short, short amount on the pitch, but he was getting onto the ball. He was making, um, you know, uh, Bobby Cordova read. You know, he's making him think, you know, should I go left, should I go right, that sort of thing. So I was impressed with that. Having a look here as well, Rob, you can see that uh, Ericsson and Casemiro midfield. Ericsson with his first goal and an assist as well. So he had a really good performance. I think on the ball, you know, at times... He, he gave the ball away, but good performance with him. Martial started up front. Um, you know, should have scored, probably shouldn't he as well. Uh, there was an opportunity in that first half. But generally speaking, you know, you, I don't think United were that good. And I'm actually going to move it on to the stats because they don't really say actually how I feel about the game. And I was thinking if United didn't win this, it's a, it's a failure. But I don't think United were particularly good. I think uh, we lacked control. We lacked possession in midfield. Um, I don't think the press was was great to be honest i think you know i think that uh united played better but all in all we had 14 sh shots apiece you know 12 from open play so we create chances and you look at the conversion as well we did better than fulham with 14 percent ultimately that's a massive victory going into the world cup and uh you know united win their game in hand and that they're up into the top four and they're, they're one point behind the rampant newcastle and then you've got city and little uh, city and arsenal actually ahead as well so all in all considering where the first two games went poor defeat against villa you know, I'd have done really well to, uh, you know, to turn things around again. Yeah, it's like I always say, you know, if you play badly, win. So that's kind of what it comes down to. You know, that's the trick of football, isn't it? At the top level is that you don't have to be a nine out of 10 every week. You can be a seven out of 10. You can be a six out of 10. Just win. Get your victory. Get your points. That's what keeps the ship moving in the correct direction. That's how you do it. So you said that United weren't very good. I think for the first hour... United did control proceedings. You know, I think in the first half as well, they 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 were better on the ball. There was more invention. This is why when you kind of look at the shots from open play, United ended up having 12 shots. But of course, in the last half an hour, they gave the ball away a lot. They gave a lot of space to Fulham and Fulham wrestled control. So I think you have to give Fulham some kind of kudos for that. I think you have to say that they played well. And towards the end of the game, as I said at the, at the top of the show, it felt like Fulham were going to win it. But do you know what? They didn't. They lost 2-1. And Manchester United did actually go and win the game. They weren't given it. It was a moment of magic, you know, two players linking up, getting into the box and scoring the kind of goal that we've not been used to seeing at Manchester United for a long time. We've not been used to seeing that kind of one-two touch football, getting into the box, getting shot off. That was much more Man City, wasn't it, than it was Manchester United. So I think they're all positives. And this is why when you've won a game like that, 2-1 away from home on the road, you shouldn't be too low on the stuff that didn't quite work because you can go and fix those things. You can get back to training and say this, this, this and this. Now, of course, we've got a World Cup coming up. That now takes precedent. But Man United are going to be training together for the next five or six weeks. They're going to have a week off in the middle and they're going to be at training camp in Spain. So the manager still has now time with a section of these players. I think the seven I worked out who are not going to the World Cup of what I would call bona fide squad players who would play in matches in rotation with the youngsters. So you can go away and really work on stuff like the pressing, like the off ball stuff, and also some of the more on ball things that you're not doing very well. So I, I think overall you win the game two one, you should be relatively happy with that. Well it's important, Rob, that United won the game because you've seen Chelsea faltering now under Potter and yeah. <laughs> seeing Potter out. I mean, you know, that I, th I think that's gonna end particularly well over there. He needs a little bit more time. But you know Chelsea Chelsea have faltered in recent weeks. Liverpool starting to come back as well. You know, they won their game. Mm -hmm. Newcastle in fantastic form. Spurs just somehow are finding ways to win games. It's unsustainable, but they're just somehow winning games. They're showing great results. So United had to win this game. You mm -hmm. see City as well dropping points. City look a little bit out of sorts, I'll be honest. You know, they, they seem to be very Haaland-centric at the minute. So it's really important that United took advantage. And in years gone by, this is a result you would have lost, right? You would have gone to Craven Cottage last game. Uh, after everyone else has played, knowing that, you know, you get a win, you can close the gap and then United lose the game. So I think it showed great resolve. I just want to pick out something here, which is interesting. And this will almost segue when we do talk about um, 
you know, the 38 year old um, man child <laughs> that we're going to talk about a little bit later on. But, um, you know, we created a high number of chances relative to possession. So it just shows that we are creating chances as yeah. a team. And this is what, when people are saying that there's not enough um, service for the number nines, I actually think, you know, Martial first start in a while. So he looked a little bit rusty, should have got a goal. We saw that. Remember the one in the second half really early on, Alanga went through and then Marcus, I believe it was Marcus also missed after with the follow-up. So United are creating chances. So it just makes you think that, you know, we're seeing the system working. We're seeing it ticking. We're seeing the players, you know, understand that they're, they're, they're able to understand their positioning and rotations and spacing, etc. They're making good decisions on the ball where they're lacking is the finishing and it makes you think that you know if you know i can get a number nine whether it's january or whether it's in the summer someone that can put the ball in the net this team is gonna go to the next level yeah and this is how you build it so this is where you get there so and i think it's definitely worth highlighting that that this was not Manchester United's first team. Let's be honest. There was lots of changes, lots of players playing out of position and the expectation. I think this is again for United fans to kind of judge their team and how they feel about the team is that there will be games like this where you are weaker for whatever reason. So let's talk about, as you said again, about Malassia. So I think that Malassia has struggled in recent times when he's been in the team, both at left back and we saw a right back. The issue isn't that he's on the right. The issue is that he's struggling with certain parts of his game. So you did see that United were quite ineffective on the right-hand side for that first hour. But what happened? You took a langer off and you got worse. That's what happened. So as much as people might feel that it wasn't entertaining or it wasn't where you were, when a langer came off, you were in control of the game and you took a langer off, you lost your counter-attack threat, you put Bruno on the right, you put... McTominay in the middle and United started to fail to keep the ball or progress the ball. So that's what happened. But that's because the manager is trying to keep players fresh, keep the system fresh and include people. That's what he's trying to do. So I don't have a problem with Ten Hag making those decisions because he's got to make them first and foremost. But I think the flip side of it is, and again, you did mention it, is that this shows kind of the, the weakness in the depth of the squad and that you need to continue going into the transfer window and find effective numbers. So, for instance, I don't know why wan wasn't included, but we know that wan is not wanted at Manchester United. So I think this is more what we're seeing is that there are a number of players in the squad who are not wanted, not needed, who are going to be moved on. So they're not being as in included as much. So the manager's going, well, I'll take my left back who I'm going to play and I'm going to play him right back because he can play it. It's now more about can you add to those pieces in the transfer window? Because we've got transfer window coming up now straight after the World Cup. Can you find one, two, even three to just help that rotation in numbers? And if you do that, then when you get injuries, you can help yourself, can't you? Like, I think the manager could have played Lindelof at right back and could have played Maguire. I probably think that's an Probably should have done that. And, I, and, in, and in retrospect, in hindsight, great. That, that tells you something, doesn't it? We said, yeah, you know, Maguire should have played and people don't want Maguire to play. But I think on the flip side of that is that up until the hour mark, you were kind of in control and the right-hand side wasn't working. Then you changed the right and you completely unraveled and had no control and you lost everything that you'd built up over an hour point. So this is again about learning. And I think the manager learns about his team and the team learns about their own limitations and their strengths. Well, Rob, there's a few things. So um, just touching it quickly. So you... you pushing you know spoke about it off air pushing Bruno to the right hand side hmm. I think Ten Hag's in-game management has been a little bit strange I know he's trying to juggle keeping players fresh the World Cup coming up etc thin squad you know Anthony's a very rare profile on that right hand side that we don't have in the squad so that's why Anthony will start week in week out so I actually feel that when you shift Bruno out to the right hand side I think that completely affects United off the ball because he is that he's he's the leader when it comes to the press and then the second thing that, that it affects is United's ability to control and, and create as well. And he's not right-sided. That goal came on that right-hand side, right? Mm. Um, he was, he was at fault for it. Malasio was at fault for it as well. And then you had Short switching off at the back post and Dan James scored. <clears throat> but what I will say about um, Bruno, what, what, what Ten Hag's learning as well is how important Bruno Fernandes is. I know, you know, you have maybe a few frustrations with how he can be sometimes petulant. But we've seen that when Bruno Fernandes doesn't play, Van der Beek is not an adequate like-for-like -like replacement, both on the ball and off the ball. So United need to get to a situation and a point where they have, let's say Bruno doesn't play, a, an almost like-for-like -like player can come in and do that role to the same level. So it's interesting to see. But Ten Hag's learning so much about the squad. 
Mm. As long as United are picking up results this season, that's all that matters. They need to get into that top four. It's it's almost impossible in your squad of 25 plus or whatever to have the perfect like-for-like like replacements. It doesn't happen in football. You have players who play the same position, but give you different attributes and have different weaknesses. And I think when you look at Bruno Fernandes, and, and I'll continue to be hard on Bruno, because when Bruno is good, he's really important. You know, he was really important with the goal. He slides the ball across. Ericsson puts the ball in the net. And I actually think yesterday was one of his better games playing through the middle. But if you're going to have to do a job for your team because you you haven't got Anthony, as you called him there, unique profile, I, I totally agree with that. If you need to, if you take the pace out your team with a langer, Bruno's got to go do the job. And I think what you see with Bruno is that when he goes to the right, he is capable of doing more Haydar, but he's just a little bit off it. So like he gives the ball away in that moment because he's trying to save it. Just let the ball go out. Get the ball, let the ball go out, go back in position. Be smart. Yeah, play the game. Think about what's going on around you. Bruno Fernandes too often doesn't think like that. He wants to be the virtuoso creator, doesn't he? But if you're on the right-hand side and you're doing that profile, then just let the ball go out. Don't fight for it. Get back in position. Set up again. You're winning the game, aren't you? So think about that. So I think that's kind of the bit. It's not ideal, Bruno playing on the right-hand side. I think going forward. You could probably say in weeks and months to come that Christian Eriksen goes to the right, goes and plays that role like he did for Spurs. He's played off the right before. It's not a big deal for him. He doesn't have the pace going that way either like Bruno doesn't have. But I think he's technically and tactically a more astute individual. That's what he is. And Bruno isn't. So I've got no big issue with the manager playing Bruno on the right because I think that his hands were tied when you think about all the injuries that United have had and what they're carrying. Um, he felt that Alanga could do an hour's worth of work. Alanga did that work pretty well, but then you couldn't keep Alanga there. The other choice was maybe putting Rashford on the right. Rashford looked poor from the right the week before. So you're thinking to yourself, well, why do I do certain things? It's more about, it's not, not the World Cup coming up. It's more about how do you keep your players fresh within the 90 minutes? How do you do it? And I think if United, if Bruno doesn't give that ball away and Malassia doesn't bomb on and get caught, United defend that moment pretty easily, probably probably find that Fulham don't score in that game. So these little moments, these little mistakes are really vital in the match. And these are the things that United need to clean up. Absolutely. Guys, thank you for all your great comments as well. Uh, keep them coming because we're going to be talking about Cristiano Ronaldo. So I want to hear whether you agree with what he said. If you agree with some of what he said, I want to hear in the comments if you disagree and why you disagree i want to hear all of them because we're going to be making this really interactive we're going to be reading as much many comments out as possible so make sure you get those comments in <clears throat> rob where do we begin i mean look i'm just gonna i'm gonna talk about sort of like you know i went to bed i was, I was pretty i was pretty pissed off i'll be honest with you i was annoyed i was annoyed because as you said we said at the beginning of the show garnacho's big moment right garnacho fantastic goal bursting onto the scene and he's just taken that away from him so that was the first thing that annoyed me but when I'm having a look at this graphic up on the screen, it's with the sun, it's with Piers Morgan. That's That annoyed me as well, I'll be honest with you, because of all the people, as you mentioned, that he could have gone to, he went to this guy. But it's just it's just a lack of self-awareness. I think it's the, the lack of loyalty, the betrayal. He talks about United have betrayed him. He says, I don't respect Eric Ten Hag. There was no empathy for my sick uh, girl. I've been made the black sheep. I'm just going to read out a few let's say, misdemeanors that Ronaldo has done under Eric Ten Hag since Ten Hag's joined the club. So he announced he wanted to leave two days before the pre-season. He failed to turn up to pre-season. His agent shopped him around Europe to any big club. Nobody wanted him. So he came back. He was on the bench, rightly so. Refused to come on as a sub against Spurs. Walked down the tunnel, left before the game finished. <sighs> During this whole time, Rob, Ten Hag has... Um, he, I feel like he's backed him. He's backed Ronaldo, especially in the media. He's covered for him. He's has respected him. He hasn't started him in football matches, but no one has a divine right to start. And that has been the biggest problem with United over the last decade or so, is that players not being picked on merit. This is what we wanted for our manager to come in and do. You know, he's uh, he made him captain last week. I think that was actually a mistake for the Villa game. He made him captain. I know it's not maybe not that big of a deal. I thought it was a mistake. All of these things, Ronaldo has disrespected Ten Hag, almost betrayed Ten Hag, let's put it in those terms. I think this whole situation, there's no coming back from it, as we've already said. It's tarnished his legacy for me. As someone who was so excited, you remember we did shows upon shows about how excited I was that he joined. 
and ultimately at the end of the day, it just shows his character i think as a person i think he's a narcissist i'm just going to say it i think he only cares about himself i don't think he really cares about the club this isn't to get the glazers to sell or to expose the glazers because i don't think he said anything about that we didn't know we know that the training ground is dilapidated and old we know that there's issues in terms of modernizing the club this is nothing new I, you know the, any united fan could tell you about that so he's not doing anything revolutionary here what he's done is he's uh, insulted the club he's insulted his manager doesn't respect his manager and he's a cancer to the football club right now so very disappointed um and this is not even the whole interview yet we're going to see it come out in the next day or so yeah and we only got snippets so I, I was i was really yeah i was really i was really i was re- i've been pretty annoyed all day about it just because of you you're having a go at ten hog who's actually someone who's trying to turn things around we know the issues are the, the glazers we have someone there as a manager who's actually trying to modernize and improve the club and try and win football matches and you're demeaning him because because you're not playing football matches because you're not the star anymore because you're 38 years old selfish rob it's selfish man it's selfish but cristiano is selfish that's what he is he's always been that he's been nothing but that his whole life his whole career everyone who works with cristiano ronaldo or has worked with cristiano ronaldo will tell you that directly now some see that as a positive trait as a footballer, as an individual, scoring goals, being selfish, putting the ball in the back of the net, wanting the ball, you know, at his feet. Okay, that's cool when you're 25 and you're winning Champions Leagues coming out your ears and you've got a team at Real Madrid where it's like absolutely elite in every position and they can hide your deficiencies by getting you the ball in good areas and you can score goals. It works perfectly. It's a good setup. But the problem is with Cristiano, at, at this age now, we know kind of how he is with some of the problems that he has on the pitch, trying to move around and being in the press and being mobile and being kind of relaxed in what he does, his work. We can totally see that this is the end of Ronaldo, can't we? I think anyone that watches our football club every game, every minute of every game, cannot come to any other summary than that. That this is not a United problem. This is not a Ten Hag problem. This is not a player problem. This is a Ronaldo problem. Yeah, and your Ronaldo number nine shape at the very, very top end of the pitch has caused you to lose games, not just now, but last year when you came sixth. So even when he scored 20-odd goals, he was still the major reason why you were not scoring enough goals to win games. That's the truth. So these things merge into one, Hayden. Like I said to you before the show, like let's talk about Ronaldo today and tomorrow because I think that's the most important thing. But there's two ways of looking at this and I want to kind of be really succinct and straight about it. If he really wanted to talk about the Glazers and talk about the issues around the football club, and we know they're plenty, plentiful, we talk about them all the time with the ownership, with the investment, with the debt and all of those things, he could have gone to someone like Henry Winter at the Times done a proper interview with him, a proper sit down and been as scathing and as hard hitting as he wanted to be and as honest and as straight and do that in good faith. And what did he do instead? Look at this picture we got on the screen. He chose the worst form of tabloidism. He chose the worst form of tabloid hack. He chose it. So this is on Cristiano. So whatever he believes about the football club, when he uses the word betrayal, it is the pot calling the kettle black. Yeah, so I don't care what he thinks he's or feels. Rob. He's a hypocrite. But the reason why he's saying these things is that he does know that this is the end of his career at the very top. And like a child, you, know, you called him a man child, that's what he is. In this petulance, he thinks, well, let's just burn the house down at the very end because that's my choice because I'm Cristiano. I'm worth a billion dollars. I am going to be a superstar till the day I die. Something I've said before, you know, he will always have those gazillion Instagram followers that, that validate him and push him forward. He uses social media for those things. It's important to him. And what he's doing with this on the second side of it is he's enabling all of them. He wants them to attack the United fans that look out for Man United. That's the truth. This is what this is about. So he's creating a civil war at our football club that no one deserves. We don't deserve it. Ten Hag certainly doesn't deserve it. 
maybe the Glazers deserve a little bit of it. And I think United fans, virtually 95%, nearly 100, are wholly against the ownership, and so they should be. But this isn't about that. This is about him, Cristiano, and Cristiano massaging the facts to create a narrative, to create a war that shouldn't be there. You know, the facts are, Cristiano, you're not very good anymore. Yeah, so when people have been defending you on fan channels for the last six months and saying how great you are, I don't know what they're watching. They're not watching the football. That's all about feelings. And I said to you off air as well, this is feelings versus facts. Yeah, the facts are telling us something, but people's feelings are saying something else. This is about Cristiano's feelings. Because if he was talking about facts, the facts are, Cristiano, you don't score many goals anymore. And you don't press the ball you never have. And you don't help United win football matches. It's as simple as that. Rob, I'll read some comments out in a second. But something I do want to say, I mean, look, you're absolutely spot on. But what I do want to say as well is that he's always been like this. But what masked hmm. over this attitude and this arrogance. And, and, and partly, Rob, partly these characteristics he's displaying are the reason why he's going to be one of the greatest, if not the greatest player of all time. Hmm. His, um, you know, his almost single vision towards being the best and being the greatest and doing everything. But what does that mean that, you know, he puts his teammates or his team, um, you know, at let's say a, a disadvantage because of some of his actions fine, but it means that he scores goals. But what I do want to say is that he's not offering anything on the pitch anymore. So you can't have this, I was going to say like a cancer in the dressing room around because it's just going to unravel everything. And I think I'm going to say to about to Eric Ten Hag, he is one of my biggest concerns with Ten Hag was actually, can you handle the big egos? You saw him at Ajax. Uh, you know, I wouldn't say that the team was littered with, you know, star players or big name players, but he made them into a fantastic functioning system and almost a juggernaut, you know, maybe the best Ajax team in a long, long time since maybe the Van Hall team, you know, that in the, in the 95, um, but he's handled this so, so well. He's handled this so gracefully. He's handled this. He's almost shown that I am the boss. And I, unfortunately, Ronaldo just can't take that. And that's why he's come out and done what he's done. And to say I don't dis I don't respect Eric Ten Hag is it's just so low, Rob. What does Sir Alex say? You know, as soon as a player is difficult to control or, you know, they go out of line, that's when you've got to get rid of them. And, and this is what you have to do, Ronaldo. So I'm going to read out some comments here. Connor saying, banish him to the under-21s and the reserves. Um, Alan saying Ronaldo wants things that are incompatible, highly paid first choice striker tactics based on him. Champions League, he has spectacular lack of self awareness. Let's actually talk about the tactics based on him because he mm -hmm. was disgustingly rude to Ralph Raniuk. And I'm seeing a lot of people laugh. And Ralph Raniuk is, we are, we're both champions of Ralph Raniuk. Did it work out as a coach? No. Was it a poor stint? Yes. But he wasn't brought in to do that. We all know that. It was going to be the consultant. He's absolutely spot on. We're sitting here now in you know November, and he said back in March, United need 10 new players. I still think United do. They, maybe they brought in five more. I still think they need six or seven more to, to supplement the squad. To turn around and say, I didn't know who he was, and someone, it's just so rude, Rob. Like, and, and I think, did Jurgen Klopp say something, I think, or yeah. along those lines, or you tweeted, I'm going to let you, I'll let you sort of go into that because it's just, he said the comments about Wayne Rooney as well. He's just mm -hmm. a child and it's just a personal attacks. And that's the problem. So he can go and say the training grounds dilapidated, etc. But his personal attacks on certain people, you're 38 years old, you're meant to be professional, you're meant to be the leader. It's just wrong. Yeah, I, I think as well, you know, like Cristiano's English is good enough for him to totally understand what he's saying. There's like no gaps in his knowledge of English. He spoke in English for many, many years, decades. So he knows what he's trying to put across and the point that he's trying to make. Um, about Ralph Raniuk, and I think it is important to kind of start there because he made a big point of this in the interview with Piers Morgan, kind of saying, like, who was this guy to manage Manchester United? Well, the week that he came to Manchester United, all of the managers in the Premier League lined up to talk about Ralph Raniuk because they will last, obviously. It's a big news story. And Jurgen Klopp said, I remember it clearly like yesterday, Jurgen Klopp kind of sighed and went, well, now, now Man United have got a proper manager and I know what I'm talking about. This man knows what he's talking about. This is a proper coach who's coming to take on a big football club. And I think when Ranić left, he kind of backed that up and said, well, the problem there is that Ranić wasn't backed by either the players or maybe the Manchester United board and that became a problem. We know that that's how it went, wasn't it? Like we saw the first 20 minutes against Crystal Palace. We saw the players running and for 20 minutes we got excited. And I remember being there at Old Trafford 
so, so happy. Like, wow, this is a new era. And it wasn't Ralph Ranick's fault they didn't run after that. He didn't tell them to stop running. The problem was, is that you had a guy like this in the dressing room who was actually the mouthpiece. This is quite also why I talk about Ronaldo more in this sense than say Paul Pogba. Because Paul Pogba wasn't telling players these things. It was Imagine Cristiano. it was Pogba, Rob. That's what I'm Yeah, so say. this is the thing. So this is, this, like again, let's not, let's, go, not, let's not kind of drag it back to Pogba. But I kind of put that in there because Pogba is, again, the kind of guy that would get hammered for this kind of thing when he wasn't really even involved. I think the things with Cristiano, and again, you look at the managers, Thomas Tuchel was like, this manager is elite. You know, you go along the board, uh, all across Germany, every coach would say to you that this was the godfather of the Gagan press. This is the guy that invented these tactics. Now, yeah, I think it's also true to say that he hadn't had a lot of managerial experience in the last year, two, three, four, go, going back. But he's a coach. He knows what he's doing. And the reason why it didn't work wasn't because he didn't know what he was doing. He was a better coach than Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Let's be honest. So United thought they would work bringing him, him in short term and then having him involved in the football club. And when it didn't work, what had to happen was that you got Ten Hag and Ten Hag went, I don't want these complications. I want to run the club. And United went, yes. So that was as simple as that. That's why Ranić left the football club. We've seen since that Ranić teams have done all right, that they look pretty exciting. He looks younger. He's come away from Old Trafford. He looks like a younger man uh, and good luck to him. But I think that the, the fact that Cristiano made that point and then said, well, who was this guy? That doesn't just smack of arrogance. That smacks of ignorance. So if you don't know Cristiano, if you don't read what this guy is about or who he is, fine. But don't come, don't go on the television and sit with Piers Morgan and say that because you're going to look a little bit stupid. So I think that Ronaldo thinks he's being clever by making these observations to say Rob, that he do you, doesn't... Hold on. Do you think that Ronaldo genuinely thinks that the fans are going to be on his side? Because I've seen a lot of people say this. And I, I'm sometimes I'm sort of thinking maybe he's that lacking that much self-awareness that he thinks the fans are going to side with him. But the, the Old Trafford faithful particularly let's talk about match going fans they're not going to back this they're all behind ten hag they're all behind ten hag and i can see there as well in the comments i think perry's put up there she's written there about only six percent of my poll saying that they uh support ronaldo on this and i think that's accurate i do think that's why i did that poll because it's to show the split in the fan base quite often it's 50 50 on stuff isn't it Ado? when we talk about tactics we talk about individuals it can kind of have that balance there there's no balance in this United fans are not stupid. Another thing I tweeted after that was that United fans are invested in this team. They're not invested in the Glazers. And they're not invested in Ronaldo. They're invested in the team and the manager that runs that team. That's why they support Eric Ten Hag. And let's be honest, say these first few months, Hader, hadn't gone very well. Then there'd be more of a split, wouldn't there? People would be like, oh, well, the football's awful. It's not worked. A bit like with Ranić, people lost kind of their own maybe patience with Ranić, didn't they? We did. We were like, well, the team's not playing very well. What can you do here? The reason the team didn't play well is because of the players, not the manager. So I think in this case, United are playing well because of the manager, but also the players because he's got them on side. Uh, and I think that Christian, like you're saying there, you know, maybe, maybe he doesn't know what he's doing here or maybe he's not sure. I think he knows exactly what he's doing. He 100% knows that when he leaves Manchester United, he has his $1 billion night contract for life. That's in his pocket. He hopes to go to another football club where he'll earn a lot more money. That will be in his pocket. And he will go to Saudi or he will go to the MLS and he will continue scoring goals at a lower level. And he will continue to point fingers till he's 45 years old. That's what he is. And he will always be that ego. The problem is, though, Haydar now, is that, that people don't forget stuff. This will never be forgotten. What he's done here, putting it on the front page of The Sun, is not acceptable. He's pulled Rob, the club into disrepute. And that's Rob, on his shoulders, sun, not anyone else's. Issue. The Sun as well, you know, all the tabloids. Yeah. Uh, he would have got the OK on this front page. Can you see the front page there? So at the very top there, you know, again, for people who are obviously watching, uh, listening on Spotify and Apple and not watching on YouTube, so come to YouTube and look at it. You see at the very top there that Ronaldo's there shaking um, Piers Morgan's hands and the smile on both of their faces like the cats that got the cream. The problem is the cream stinks. Yeah, so if you want to glorify yourself in this, great. Ronaldo World Exclusive United have betrayed me. As much as we hate the Glazers, as much as we will never advocate the Glazers, the Glazers have not betrayed Ronaldo. The Glazers have betrayed the fans 
and the lifeblood of the football club that one person they haven't betrayed is Cristiano. They pay him half a million pound a week, Haydar, and he's not even good enough to get in our team. So we need to have kind of some kind of rectification of this now. We need to make sure that this is fixed. And I think really that once the lawyers are now over this, United have announced that they are looking into it and that they are very aware of what Cristiano said. I do hope that when they come to the obvious conclusion that this is gross misconduct, that they sack the player. Because I think if any player did this, you would you'd be calling for that. If it was, I don't know, let's go let's look at the team. If it was, I said this yesterday as a joke, like if it was Nemanja Matic leaving the football club, you know, a year before because he's finished and he's not good anymore, and he and he attacked the football club, you'd say, Well, bin him, you know, get rid of him, rip up his contract and let him go. That's where we are with Ronaldo, and Ronaldo wants that. That's what he's doing. He's trying to manufacture a way out. And he will say forevermore for the next 10 years, oh, I left because I was supporting United's fans' attack against the, the Glazers. That's why I did it. No, you didn't. You didn't do that. You did it because you wanted to give Piers Morgan the scoop. And that's what your, your wishes were. Ultimately, no one has ever burnt their legacy like this at Manchester United. It's a unique, it's a unique moment in the history of our football club. But let's be honest, this is what Cristiano is. It's just it's just the fact he went to Morgan, Rob. That that's that's actually one of the most that's one of the most annoying things. He's a, he's just so smug the way you know the way that he goes on and on. I, I actually tweeted this. I said if he goes on about Cristiano Ronaldo about how great he is and you know how United should build their team around him, we know and we'll show this with statistics of how that the team just performed worse. I'm actually gonna bring it up now. Hmm. You tweeted about it. I'm going to take so, it back to football because it's important. Yeah. I think we take this debate back to football. Yeah. So this season, uh, you know, with Ronaldo United, have a 25% win percentage. Without him, it's 70%. That, I mean, that's just, that's huge. When he plays, they have one point per game. When he doesn't play, it's 2.2. Average goal scored, 0. 0.5. So it's not even in one one game, one goal per game. Uh, when he doesn't play, it's 1.8. Uh Average goals conceded 1.8 uh, to 1.3 without, and then average kilometers covered per game 103 with 107.5 out. I mean, to be honest with you, it's uh, it's not surprising. We see this around with our own eyes on the pitch. I mean, I don't think anyone turns around and thinks Marcus Rashford's a long term choice or solution at number nine. But what he offers for the collective as a team, compared to you know what Ronaldo can offer, it's just night and day. And I think I think this is the thing. And I tweeted, I said that would Arsenal be sitting top of the table if they had Ronaldo and says Jesus. Jesus has made the most defensive contributions for a number nine. He's been absolutely amazing. He's getting a lot of stick, I'm seeing, because people clearly don't understand the role of, of, of a modern number nine in a pressing modern system. But yes, they have to score goals. But he is the best off the ball. And he's winning the ball back high up the pitch and he's allowing the likes of Martinelli and Saka to score goals so ultimately at the end of the day that's what i tweeted i said i, said, I, tweet, I tweeted pierce not that he's going to reply to me but i said that if ronaldo was number nine for arsenal week in week out would they be the best side in the league right now on top of the table no and i think that's the point so he's doing everything for clicks he he, he loves the attention and uh you know that's the frustrating thing but from a footballing perspective you know i better without ronaldo he's on a whole shed load of money per week you know i can get five good players for that for those wages so it's actually in some ways although this I mean, it hurts the way that this is happening and it's frustrating and it's and it angers me but in the long run this actually plays into ten hogs hand it's actually a positive you know what i can get rid of ronaldo because i don't really want him yeah personally obviously for myself it doesn't hurt because i think again this is part of my wider thinking about footballers in general i've worked with footballers i've kind of seen in the industry how it all unfolds and how these things happen with the media and i think overall you know you support your football club that's great leave your love there leave your heart in the club but players come and go and ronaldo is just the same as any other player when it comes to that his little stop up at manchester united was all about the zeros how much money am I earning? That's why he came to Man United. He didn't come to Man United to make Man United great again. Like, come on. And he knows he's in decline. So he, he's also aware of these things. I don't think he's ignorant of that fact, even though he's kind of saying something different. Um, like you just mentioned there about Jesus, and I know that Piers Morgan has said it as well today, that he believes that Ronaldo should come to Arsenal and then Ronaldo and Jesus would be the perfect strike combo to take them to the title. And that, of course, is a load of garbage absolute garbage like they wouldn't be a strike combo they wouldn't play you, you that would derail system. Their, their title but it doesn't challenge. matter because he said like you said he's a tabloid hack 
He's saying it for clicks because clicks pay his bills. And the more clicks that he gets, the more likely he is to get more work. That's just how it works. So that's actually a formula that works for all of us. We do get that. But then I think we all have to kind of decide whether you're going to lie to say to get clicks or whether you want to kind of put a product out there that's based more on facts. That's the balance. Some people do it better than others. It's just how it goes. And some people are good at massaging the truth to be able to get hits and clicks. That's how it goes. So Piers Morgan is the opposite end of the spectrum with The Sun and with News Corp and all of the group there that kind of do that and put that media out. And it's about sensationalism. That's kind of how it goes. But this is what I keep saying about Ronaldo. Let's bring it back to the facts because the facts are the football. So I think we've got another slide coming up here, haven't we, Haydar? Which we've got here. Oh, you've got the the actual... Yeah, I'll read out the quotes and then we'll go. Yeah, let's read the quotes, yeah. Um, so he said, yes, I feel betrayed. Some people don't want me here, not only this year, but last year too. I don't know what's going on since Sir Alex left. I've not Probably seen me. evolution <laughs> in the club. The progress was zero. I don't have respect for Eric Ten Hag because he doesn't show respect for me. If you don't have respect for me, I'm, I'm never going to have respect for you. I like listening to a child. And this it's is amazing thing to say. Amazing thing to say. Like, you're not 12, man. You know, you're in your mid-30s and you're almost a billionaire. Like, what are you saying? Yeah, it's absolutely crazy. So this is uh, the slide we have up on the screen, and this is from FB Ref. So, Rob, this is the non-penalty XG, um, include, and then also including the expected goals and expected assists. So this season, mm -hmm. what this is showing is it's showing United's most effective players in terms of goals and assists and contributions towards games. Uh, this season so far. So you have Marcus Rashford at the top. I mean, he's having a great season. You know, it's great to see what he can do. I just want to quickly want to say, Rob, uh, before we go into Ronaldo, is that, um, you know, we see players like Marcus Rashford, for example, last season. I mean, we were talking about selling him. I even said that. Like, you know what? If PSG come in with 60 million, sell him. I remember saying this at the beginning of the season and he's having a great season. So it's very, it's very funny because players can turn it around. Martial was seemingly yeah. out the door, but, you know, if it's just a shame he can't keep fit. But Ten Hag, said in the press this week that he's the sort of uh, number nine, the complete number nine that he wants, you know, in his team. So it's very funny that, you know, you might think that player is completely gone and I'm just, for example, with Marcus, but yet this season he's been United's probably most improved player. So I think, you know, when we, when we write of players like Jaden Sancho, you can see up here, he's pretty high up in this list as well. I just want to look back and just say that well, we said the same about Marcus Rashford. Sancho has a lot of talent. He's got to be better, but yeah, that's what I wanted to say. So then you've got Bruno Fernandes, who we, you know, we sometimes criticize. I'm a big fan of Bruno, but he's been very effective. Christian Eriksen, been a great signing. And uh, Jane Sanchez, then you've got Cristiano Ronaldo. So when you're having a look at that list, what does that tell you? We know already with the eye test and with the statistics I said earlier, that United are a worse side when he plays. They just are like off the ball. They're, they're nowhere near as effective. They don't win the ball as high up. They can't sustain, you know, pressure in the final third. And then on the ball, you know, United... Decision making is poor when he plays. They're all, players are consistently trying to find him instead of making another pass or a better pass. So all these sort of things. What Ronaldo had last season that he doesn't have this season, in my opinion, Rob, is that I don't want to say his finishing is not there anymore. But last season, you know, he was scoring chances. But it seems that this season, even his finishing is lagging. His his technical quality has gone down because he's just got older. He's he's not as uh, he's just not as agile as he was. So. He's in decline, basically, is what I'm trying to say. So, you know, they're not going to build a side around someone like that. And then when you look at these statistics, you know, 2.3 is what he's contributing in terms of non-penalty goals plus expected goals and assists. That's really, really low for your supposed, like he wants to be, starting number nine. For your superstar, legendary, 600 goals in my career, life striker. Um just to kind of explain this metric, because I think it's an important one. So MPXG plus XAG. This is a kind of, again, very influenced by American sports in terms of working out all of the individual metrics, kind of putting it into one that people can kind of look at and analyze. And, and, and it's, it's the proof in the pudding. So, you know, do, do you create goals? Do you help the ball get in the net, both outside the box, both inside the box? Are you a finisher? If you do any of those things really well, you'll end up with a better rating in this metric. It's kind of how it goes. So this really shows where form lies. So Marcus Rashford, people criticise Marcus all the time. Marcus will miss a chance in a game. People will say Marcus is rubbish. Marcus is this. Marcus is that. 
Marcus Rashford is showing with this metric that he's Man United's best player this season. He is, by a long way, influencing the game in the final third, on the ball, off the ball, in the box, out the box. He's doing it all. 6.2 is an incredible rating for a player like that who was coming back from bad form last year. Bruno Fernandes, on the, on the flip side of it, player that we do criticise now and then. But what we do know, Bruno, is that when he does play well, he is influential. So we said against Fulham, that ball across to Eriksen is reflected in these figures, 5.2. Christian Eriksen, who's played the whole season as a number six pretty much, started the season at 10 at times, moving forward as an eight. His metrics in this are really good. Why? Because again, that ball to Garnacho, that one-two he plays and plays him in, reflects in this kind of metric. Below that is Jaden Sancho and Cristiano Ronaldo. Jaden at 2.5, Cristiano at 2.3. Everyone and their mothers have said this season how Jaden Sancho is having a bad year. He's not doing it. He's not hitting the numbers. He's not giving United assists. He's not helping United in the box. He's not helping them in the press. Yet his metric in the MPXG plus XAG is better than Cristiano's. So Cristiano wants to play games. Cristiano wants the whole team to be about him and tactics to be about him. If I'm Eric Ten Hag or any coach, I'm looking at this metric and I'm going, don't even want this guy on my bench. This hurts my team. So this is where we talk about facts and feelings because I still think there's a lot of lot of pundits who just operate on feelings. They feel Cristiano's going to put the ball in the net. They feel he's the greatest of all time. They love him. They've got the number seven on the back. Ronaldo, they feel all this stuff. But the facts are telling us that Cristiano Ronaldo is finished at the top end of Premier League football. That's what it's telling you. Anthony's collective metric here is almost as good as Ronaldo's, but Ronaldo was here from the start of the season. We know Ronaldo didn't play those games. Anthony Martial is 1.7. He's hardly played any minutes. He's played nothing. So if Anthony Martial had started the season, I think Anthony Martial would probably be around sixes or sevens in this metric. And I do think that if he plays the second half of the season, that's where you would expect it to be. This is what Ten Hag is thinking. Ten Hag's not looking at Ronaldo's 2.3 and thinking, I can squeeze more out of this. He's thinking that 2.3 is going down. It's going the wrong way. So... There's all reasons why these why these metrics are important, but the most important reason for sports science and for, for coaches is that they give you a snapshot of productivity. They give you a snapshot of influence. The problem here is that Cristiano Ronaldo as the number nine does not influence the game. He does not help United score goals. He does not help United win games. He does not help United get more points. And on the flip side, Haydar, because he affects the press, United actually concede more goals because the ball's at the wrong end of the yeah, pitch. Yeah, yeah. So Defense that starts, starts at, the at the front, Rob. It doesn't start at the centre-back. Defence starts, starts at number again. nine. And like You mentioned there that the, about Arsenal, and you mentioned about uh, Jesus, and we talked about uh, Piers Morgan's ideas and theories on this stuff. Um, you know, why did Arsenal get rid of Lacazette and, and Dabamiang, two top players, international footballers? Well, the reason was it made them worse. That In these XG numbers, they were hurting the team. And, uh, and of course, Arteta went, I either get sacked and stick with them, or I get rid of them, bring the kids in, and I live and die by that. That's what Ten Hag's doing. Ten Hag's going to the United board. It's either me or Cristiano. These numbers are telling you that you stick with my ideas, not Cristiano, and Cristiano goes out of the football club. So that's where we are, you see, because I think when these are presented to Cristiano, he's not interested in MPXG plus XAG. He's not interested in that stuff. He'll just say, well, I scored 20 goals last year. I've, I've got to be picked. Nah, that's not how football. Let, works let's anymore. break down the. Let's uh, obviously we're, these are called hard facts. We know this, but let's actually break down when people do bring up last year. So there's a few things that I just, I just, I can't get my, wrap my head around. The first one is how people can't see that he's finished, and it's not even his fault. He's 38 years old. Like <laughs> the fact he's even playing at this level at this age says it all, right? You know, mm-hmm. even for example, Zlatan Ibrahimovic, you know, one of the greatest strikers of his generation. He's sitting on the bench, Rob, AC Milan. He understands this is my role now. I'm going to nurture the young younger players. Leao has become a fantastic player. There's other young players that he's nurturing. That's what a player of Ronaldo's stature and experience mm-hmm. should be doing. Because, you know, every everywhere in life, Rob, you have to turn around and say, you know what? I'm at my capacity, right? You yeah. can't do everything that you did when you were 20. Well, I'm 
27. So I'm saying for you, <laughs> you're not it's true. 20, 25, 27 anymore. You know, even myself, Rob, you know, like, I think sometimes I think, oh, I'm going to get back into playing 11 side football. And I think yeah, I can't kick the ball around with 18 year olds anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, you know, you're you need finished, to know your limits. Right, you're going to you're gonna have to get it. You're um, finished. <laughs> but at least I have the self awareness, unlike Ronaldo, you know. So, but this is what I'm trying to say. And, and, and it's, I'm not taking away from every, anything that he's done in his, in his career. He's been incredible. He's been the greatest. He's given me my, my favorite period of being a United fan ever. He's, he was my favorite player, so, you know, along with David Beckham, Ruben Nistelrooy. But he gave me my favorite ever period. And I'm not taking that away from him. For me, his, his legacy tarnished, yes, personally for me, because I just think you can't do what he's done. And it's, it feels like the ultimate betrayal. But I just don't understand why one people can't see this when the stats are showing this, and then you just use your eyes as well. Two, how certain ex players he's got he's got a group of enablers and yes men around mm. the Rios, um, the Roy Keens of the world, the Everers. It's just ridiculous. And and then when you disagree with him, he goes and attacks the way Wayne Rooney looks. He doesn't speak to Gary Neville. It's just ridiculous. That's yeah. the other thing. And the other thing that I can't seem to wrap my head around is that this idea that he's oh this is he's exposing the glazers or oh, this could make the glazers sell it's just not like it's just it's just rubbish he's done this all for himself he's attacked the manager he's attacked his ex-teammates uh he's attacked the chefs at carrington it, it's just totally unnecessary and it's unfortunately it's just all about ronaldo isn't it it's all about ronaldo and i think the thing is it will always be about cristiano and i think there will be you know, this is a little bit, again, comparing it to maybe other sports stars, a bit like the LeBron Jameses and Michael Jordans, where people become invested in an individual that they will stick with Ronaldo forever. You know, Ronaldo will be in 20 years' time selling biscuits or something like that. Here's Ronaldo's biscuits. Are you going to buy them? Well, they're Ronaldo's biscuits. I'm going to eat them. Thank you very much. That's how it works. That's commercialism in a nutshell. Uh, and I think with Cristiano, you know, we have to kind of look at the football side of it. And I'm telling you now, if there was any, any movement in these metrics, any movement in what I see at Old Trafford every week when I watch the boy, I call him a boy still because he is younger than me, but I watch him and I know from what I see that's the end. Yeah, that's just, it's just fact of life. You just said there about age and playing football. I remember at 37, I obviously wasn't as fit as Cristiano. No way, of course. But I remember playing in a football match, a local game. I got the ball in a halfway line. I pinged the perfect ball to the striker. The striker runs through and scored. And I felt really good about myself. I then did it again two minutes later and pulled my hamstring was out for a month. That's how it is. That's just life. Your body starts to give up. That's truth. And, and I don't want to criticise Cristiano for being old. This is the thing. It's not about just being old, but his age has taken him to a point now where he simply cannot play at the level that we need for Manchester United. That is all this is. No bitterness, no personal vendetta. But what's happened, Haydar? He's turned it into one. He's turned it all around and he's and, and he's created this, this firestorm where Manchester United fans now have to choose between club and him. And he knows that he'll always have a billion followers, whatever he does. And that controversy... He's putting through the worst tabloid channels that he could find. And this is advised by his agent, no doubt. There's no doubt that George Mendes is involved in this, that they see this as a, an applicable strategy to get out of the football club because Manchester United might now sack him. Man United might go, you know what? We are going to sit you on the bench and pay you a hundred, half a million pound a week and we'll sit you on the bench. And Cristiano, you'll look stupid and we'll stick to our guns. But I think more likely what will happen is the Glazers don't like wasting money, do they? You know, the Glazers think about their dividends and stuff like that. If there's a way of getting Cristiano off the books, they'll do it sooner rather than later. But, uh, Rob, but the, fact really Cristiano, the fact that Cristiano, anyway. to, the fact that Cristiano's had to commit gross misconduct to get what he wants is just wrong. So, like, if he's done that, then, then United fans cannot back him in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, as I was saying, look, he probably would have left anyway in January. That's the way he was heading, so I don't understand. And, yeah. you know, he's done this on the eve of the World Cup because it's going to be all about him. He's dropped that bomb, and yeah. I think that's the thing that's frustrating the most. Uh, look, what can we say about it? The, the fight, let's, let's, let's wrap up here because I think, you know, um, we could talk about Ronaldo all day, but some of the facts really, Rob, is that... The statistics are all showing, the metrics are all showing that he can't lead the line for a club like Manchester United, who have aspirations of not just Champions League football, but eventually to win titles and Champions Leagues, etc. He can't do that. The second thing is that 
we talk about professionalism from, for me, you know, we talk about professionalism. We talk about nurturing the youth. I haven't seen him do th- that once. No, I think it's all been about him. So we want people saying, bring him back, you know, Rashford can learn from him. Martial, uh, the number 11, that's no longer playing for my night. He can go and learn for him. It's, it's all absolute rubbish. It's never been about that. Um, do I think that, you know, if Ronaldo was at the peak of his powers, would he have done this? No. If he's at the peak of his powers, would he, would you play him week in week out? Yes. That's that's the reality of it. And I think if he's at the peak of his powers, I think you could probably handle or you could probably accept some of the comments he makes because he's offering so much on the pitch, but he's not offering any of that anymore. So, like, what does this mean for Ten Hag? Well, I think, you know, if United can find some sort of um, breach in contract that, that he's done, if, the, you know, there's something where it gives him the opportunity to terminate, I think they just do that and they do it. And they send him to the World Cup as a free agent. Because I, I don't think Portugal are going to win the, the, the World Cup with him at leading the, the line for them at all, to be honest with you. So, yeah, it's just a disappointing way. I'm just frustrated that we're talking about him today when we should be talking about Garnacho. I'm frustrated because, you know, he's he is my he was my favorite player growing up. I've also learned, you know, I've grown up today that, you know, I'm not going to get attached to players. But I think I broke that attachment a while ago. You know this. Like, you know, I, I ultimately, at the end of the day, I just say, say it how, how I see it. I might like a player, but if they're not... Jane Sancho is a perfect example. I absolutely love Jane Sancho, but if he's not performing... For me, he needs to sit on the bench. And that's how I'll always judge. And I think as football fans, that's how we have to do it. The club comes first. Man United comes first. We support the... Someone said this to me today, actually. We support the name on the front, not on the back. And Ronaldo's forgot that. And the new generation have forgotten that. Mm. And unfortunately, I don't think this is the first time... That's the last time, sorry, that we'll see this. Because I think Ronaldo has opened a can of worms. And I think this idea of player power and um, players going and doing something, it's, it's unprecedented, but I don't think this is the last time we'll see this if they want their way. And I think this is horrible, a horrible cancerous thing to come into football. But Man United will be better without Cristiano Ronaldo. They will be better without this circus every single week. And Eric Ten Hag, I trust him. I have my faith in him. I like him what I'm seeing on the pitch. I like the tactics. I like the way he's handling everything. I really do think if he's backed, he can bring some fantastic times back to Manchester United. So for me, Eric Ten Hag, Man United, over Man United always. After totally. Ronaldo always, sorry. No, totally. And I, and I think that, you know, Manchester United are already better when Cristiano Ronaldo is not on a football pitch. It is crystal clear in the metrics and with the eye test. Let's kind of end it on this, yeah? Because the debate for the rest of the time, you know, until the end of time will be what? Who is the GOAT, the true GOAT, Cristiano or Lionel Messi? Well, let's leave it like this. Cristiano, when he left Barcelona, thanked everyone, said goodbye. And it was one of the saddest moments of his life because he wanted to end his career at Barcelona. But Barcelona themselves are such a basket case football club. There's something they couldn't really manufacture and keep him. He had to go. So he did. But he will still say to this day that he hopes, and one of the things his quotes was that he hopes that Barcelona fans remember him as a humble individual who fought for the badge, fought for the football club, and that Barcelona will always be in his heart. Cristiano Ronaldo is the opposite of Lionel Messi. Cristiano Ronaldo is a mercenary. Cristiano Ronaldo is not a good person when it comes down to these things. He isn't. It's about Cristiano. And yes, I get that some people in the modern game and modern fans or whatever you want to call them respect that kind of nastiness, the ruthlessness or being, you know, being unkind in these moments. Yeah. And being horrible is some kind of badge of honor in social media times. But it isn't. Not really. Not in real life. It's horrible. So Cristiano Ronaldo might look back at this one day and think that he made a mistake in 2022 when he was trying to get out of Man United, I think the truth is that Cristiano Ronaldo won't actually care that much. He knows what he's trying to do. He's trying to put a bomb under the football club and blow it up so he can get what he wants. That's all it comes down to. It doesn't come down to anything else. Who's the greatest player of all time? People can debate that till you're blue in the face. I'd probably say that Lionel Messi is the better human being. I think that's kind of the way we're going to look at this going forward because United fans... They will remember this, Haydar. They will. They'll look back at this and they'll say, you did that the wrong way, Cristiano. I've and decided I like... it's messy now after this. Look, you've done, look, you've done, you're, you're, you were the biggest Cristiano fanboy I've ever known. I'll say that. Yeah, you loved him when you come back to the club. I remember you like almost in tears so happy that day. And I was happy too. I want, I said, yeah, this is interesting. You know, we get Ronaldo back and get the right Ronaldo. It could work, couldn't it? And you were absolutely high on it. And so you should have been. But we're now low on it because of Cristiano, what he is and what he's done. That's the truth. 
Yeah. So this is, we can't spin it any other way. There's no, don't get too high. Don't get too low. This is just low. And it's been dragged that way because of the player, not because of Ten Hag, not because of other individual players, not even because of the owners. My God, one thing isn't actually the Glazers fault. One thing you can blame the Glazers for is that they should never have brought him back. Yeah. A proper football club goes, yeah, he sells loads of shirts, but he's not going to help me win. So we give that extra year to Cavani, we stick with it, and then we go buy a young striker. We go get our Sesco. We go get the next player. You know, we go find Haaland. They could have put that money into Haaland and beaten Man City to the punch. Yeah. They done. didn't. They got Ronaldo instead. And they thought Ronaldo was a shrewder buy to win now. But now, now has moved on to the future. I think getting Haaland would have been the more shrewd move. So United need to reset now. We're all with Eric Ten Hag. Hopefully he gets the striker he deserves. Hopefully Martial can come back into the team and score goals and be consistent. Hopefully Marcus Rashford continues as he is. There's lots of good things to be happy about if you're a Man United fan at the moment. We go into a World Cup knowing that our team is performing and they're performing to a standard that we hope will, will keep improving the trajectory going the right way and that Cristiano Ronaldo will become a footnote of this little kind of horrible day that we've all suffered today. And Haydar, we won't have to speak about him ever again. Isn't that great? Like when Pogba left, that's what I said about it. I don't blame Pogba for a lot of that stuff, but it's so nice to not have to talk about it anymore. So nice. And it's going to be the same with Cristiano. Give us the number seven on your way back out, mate. And let's maybe hang that on Garnacho's shoulders. That's a big call. But maybe he's the right guy to carry the club forward because Ronaldo was when he was 18, given that number, and we gave it to him and we trusted him for the long term. And he did all right in that time. Maybe Garnacho, he might not stay his whole career at United, but maybe he, rather than Jaden Sancho at this moment of time, is the right person to have that number on his back. Guys, that's a wrap. Thank you so much for all your fantastic comments. Seems that everyone is on the same page, which is very rare to say about Man United fans that are on the same page regarding Ronaldo. It's such a shame how this has turned out. Make sure you give us a follow on at Man United MC. Give me a follow on at Hader underscore Rabani. And give Rob a follow on at underscore Rob underscore B. We might have seen Ronaldo going out the door, but we have positivity with Garnacho. He's a real Viva Garnacho. Viva, Viva Garnacho. That's the song. Absolutely. It's going to happen. It's going to have to be. It's going to have to be. And guys, enjoy the World Cup. Enjoy the break. Hopefully England will win it. And we'll see you next time.